Hi, this is Rich Colvin. I want to introduce you to my Rose Engine lathe. It's made from 3 quarter inch medium density fiberboard, also known as MDF. It may not look like MDF, but that's because I painted mine mustard yellow to match my Powermatic 3520B that I like so much. The blue T-Track on it is meant to uh, give honor to Carter Products, who make a lot of the tools that I use on my 3520B. The design for this machine came from John McGill, and I put a link to his site in the notes. So now let's take a look at it in more detail. So this is the left side of the machine, and I'm going to talk about the key parts of a Rose Engine lathe that really differentiate it from a more traditional lathe, and that's what I'm going to cover first. So it's got a headstock that pivots, and you can see that here. This is a bit of an extreme movement, but you get the general idea. The rocking is controlled by the shape of this rosette, and you can see the bumps here on the edge. It's similar to a cam in an engine. This one is a Sign 24, which has 24 lobes along this edge, and those 24 lobes are 15 degrees apart, which is pretty easy math. 360 divided by 24 gives you 15 degrees. So one of the great inventions on this is this phasing pin, which lets you move it along these holes here and readjust the phasing of this rosette relative to the rest of the machine here. And each of those lobes is represented by two pins, so I can move it one pin and go half a lobe for a lot of good phasing. That would be 7.5 degrees in this case. We also have a touch, uh, that's this piece here, the white one. Um, some people call it a rubber, I prefer the term touch. They would call it a rubber and that's historically what it was called because this touch would rub up against the rosette. This is adjustable on the T-Track here, this is the one supplied by John. But uh, once you get it in place and get it set, you don't really move it anymore. At least for that cut, you may change it for a different cut or a different rosette. Indeed, the thing that is nice on this one, too, is that I can put two rosettes on here. I don't show that, but you can see the space here to allow for that. The other thing that's nice that John recently introduced is that uh, we have a stepper motor here. And the value of a stepper motor is that we run this at very slow speeds. And sometimes it runs as low as less than 1 RPM, but 10 to 15 is more common. So. The uh, stepper motor gives us that capability of having torque at such a low speed, where if we used a variable frequency drive and we ran it at low speed, you would lose a lot of torque. The piece down here is for the amplitude, adju amplitude adjuster. I'll talk about that later, but that's what that's for. So let's see what this looks like in action. Now you can see the rocking of the head quite easily. I moved the camera to the other end of the lathe and we're going to continue with some overview and definitions. I'm sure this little display here caught your attention so I'll start here first. This is the human machine interface for controlling the stepper motor or motors. This design can accommodate up to four stepper motors but the other three was going to be a discussion for a later uh, video. For now I'm using it only to turn the machine on to adjust the speed or turn it off. As noted before it runs very slowly let me show you from this end. This HMI gives us the capability of adjusting the speed. We can go very fast. And I know that's not very fast for those of you used to running you know, 2000 RPM, but you can see it's bouncing, so it's too fast for this. And we can run very slowly. And there are some artists that do this. I know one who turns uh, items with bone and has to turn very slowly for that cut, and she turns you know, less than one RPM. So, this uh, is a nice feature. I don't usually turn that slowly. Usually mine is in this range. There's a tensioner that's right here, and it's used to ensure that the rosette and the touch stay engaged. It can be eased or increased based on need, but not really much is needed. You can see that it's uh, pretty loose, but at the end of the day, you really only need as much as, po as required. If it's too tight, it actually can cause problems and can cause the rosette to jump. So it's, it's important to not be too tight. There's a blue indexing ring. This is something I added from what John had designed here. This one is an indexing plate, and I got this from Alisam. It provides indexing at 5 degrees for each of the outer holes, and uh, that's sufficient for what I would do with this. So we also have a fading stop, 
that's here, it slides up or down. Um, it's used for certain design options that are going to be discussed in later videos. The spindle here doesn't have a Morse taper in the end of it, and I suspect that John made it this way to keep the cost down. It's something I'll probably add later, or maybe I'll replace the spindle shaft with one that has a Morse taper. But it does have a standard 1 inch by 8 threads per inch, so I use a traditional 4 jaw chuck in this. As with other lathes, there are other options that you can use for work holding that I'm not going to be discussing in this video. To make a design in the wood, we have to use a cutting frame. This right here is the horizontal cutting frame, and it's called that because this cutter, which you can see coming out here is a fly cutter, spins horizontally. There also are vertical cutting frames where it would spin vertically, and universal cutting frames where you can rotate that between horizontal and vertical, or you know, any angle in there between. We also have drilling frames, and there are various other options, but I'm going to cover those in a later video. For this one, the horizontal cutting frame is what we're going to use. As I said, the cutting frame has a removable cutter called a fly cutter. It's my preference because I can actually shape that cutter to make whatever cuts I want and it's uh, less difficult to machine the spinning cutting holder here than if I used a, say, a carbide triangular cutter. Though you can buy those. The cutting frame is held in a quick change tool post. That's this one. Uh, the size I use is a 0x alpha and it works sufficiently for me. Some recommend the Alpha X Alpha. That's uh, kind of a choice you want to go with yourself. I got this one from Little Machine Shop. The Quick Change Tool Post is held in the cross light here, which I also got from Little Machine Shop, and it gives us movement in two axes. The axis controlled by this uh, revolving lever moves it back and forth along the X axis, and an object held here in the um, lathe. Remember it's held on its side, so the axis that we would move here on this side is going to be in the Z axis. So uh, that's why you may hear some people call this an XZ cross light or an X-ray Z. This one is from Little Machine Shop as I said. There are others that are much better than this one, but usually they're a bit more expensive or quite a bit more expensive sometimes. So this is used to cut, position the cutting head wherever I want it to be and then this as well is held in place onto, I use a magnetic uh, switches here to hold it down to the steel plate. The cutting frames are typically driven by overhead drives or they can be direct driven. The overhead drive has certain advantages that I prefer and what you'll see here is that these uh, rubber, rubberish type drive Cables go to an overhead drive. I'm not going to outline that. There's a really good article by John McGill on how to make one of those. But it is driven by an overhead motor. So let's show how a piece being cut looks. This is a piece of ash that I spray painted black to make it easier to see what happens. Ash is good for prototyping as it's really hard and it holds designs well, but it's not really good for finished pieces as the grain can be too prominent and can overpower the ornamental design. Normally I'd have a vacuum going to get rid of the dust, but that's really noisy and it can get in the way of the filming, so you'll have to uh, just take my word for that. So we're going to do the side of this first, and then we're going to do the end. Uh, let's do a few rotations, and you'll see what's going on here. Now I've advanced it 10,000. We're still cutting, so I'll go another 20,000 then. Another 20,000. 
2000s. And another 20,000. Okay, we're going to go another 20,000. We're getting close to where we're going to stop. Okay, I'm going to stop now and reposition the camera and we'll do the end of it. Okay, I moved the camera so you can better see the end cutting. And I also rotated this item relative to the rosette by a half a lobe or seven and a half degrees. That's also called a phase change. So now let's cut that end. Going another ten thousand. And ten more. This is one of the things I really love about this machine. If I can let it go here and hone it a little bit, go grab a cup of coffee and come back and it'll be beautiful. Okay, let's advance this another seven and a half degrees and then do the final cut. And here we go. So another 10,000. And 
another thin. Okay, I think you can see it rotating around, but let me stop and I'm going to show it to you without the bumping. So there you have it. That's a nice little medallion that would be a great drawer pull or some other kind of piece of art you may want to put onto your finished piece. And it could be taken off this lathe and put onto a more traditional lathe to uh, give it what other shape you want to have. Maybe you want to have an undercut for a pull knob or something else. But as you can see, the Rose Engine lathe gives us some really nice designs. Thanks for your time, and I'm going to put some more videos later. Bye-bye.